1965, the Rolling Stones have problems. Alan Klein was already rich. He was also known as a savvy music business manager. He wanted more. ABKCO bought their entire back catalog, but Klein wasn't their business manager. Jagger wasn't pleased. Alan Klein, reviled as the baddest villain in countless stories in popular music. But is this idea of Klein fair to what really happened? In the first part of this trilogy, we've seen Alan's troubled rise to the top. Now, I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. One that will explore Klein's actions as the manager of one of the biggest rock and roll bands in history, the Rolling Stones. Five young, raunchy kids who Klein showered with money and career opportunities they could only dream of. It will be a journey that will show you Alan's genius and ability to deliver far beyond what he promised. One that will expose unfairness, misdemeanor, and character flows on a level at least on par with those of the Stones and their manager Andrew Oldham. Spring 1965, the Rolling Stones have problems. Sure, their records do well in the UK. They are the rough, dirty and dangerous alternative to the Beatles. But things go less well elsewhere. Controversy and violence from the public hurt their 1964 foreign tours. And their first US tour stood out as disastrous. Booked by clueless wrestling promoters, the Stones performed in half-empty venues in the middle of nowhere. Worse still was the public humiliation on national television. Appearing on ABC's The Hollywood Palace, they were lampooned by Dean Martin, presented as a comedy group. Only 45 seconds of their film three-song performance aired. The truth was that however much the Stones cared about conquering the States, after all, they were a blues band at their core, over there, they were less successful than other British invasion acts. The Animals, Dave Clark Five, Herman's Hermits, Freddy and the Dreamers. The Stones were also poor. They didn't receive much royalty money from their label, Decca. The blame for the situation fell on one of the two managers of the band, Eric Easton. The other one, Andrew Oldham, was young, energetic, hip. His connections and marketing ideas had given the Stones their exposure at home, and he was still well liked by Jagger and Richards at the time. Easton had to go, and Oldham had the replacement ready. In 1964, Alan Klein was already rich after getting control of all the rights over Sam Cooke's music. He was also known as a savvy music business manager after negotiating Cook's new record deal with RCA. Alan was starting to savor the success he craved since his childhood, initial proof to himself and the world that he was worth the love and praises his father never gave him. But the loneliness and abandonment of his childhood still burned inside Klein. He wanted more, so when RCA asked him to get them the Beatles, he took a plane to London. We'll talk about this in the third episode of this saga. Klein wasn't successful in his London mission, but it was there that Old Ham approached him. Andrew explained the stone situation to Alan. Could he hire Klein to sort things out? Klein agreed. Old Ham would manage the day-to-day -day necessities of the band, steer their marketing and their musical direction. Klein would be the Stones' business manager. Technically, it was Oldham to be his client, but Klein's task was to deliver more money to the Stones, shelter them from the exorbitant UK taxes as much as possible, give them the connections to play bigger and better venues in the States. Klein 
actually did all of that in a few months. But how? And why, despite his successes, he came to be detested by the Stones? Klein sprung to action. He spent a week in New York absorbing every contract and document pertaining to the Stones' current business situation. He listened to every song they had ever released to assess their full potential. And then he booked a meeting at Decca in London for the Stones and Oldham. They were told to wear sunglasses, look angry, and not to open their mouths. It was Klein who was to do all the talking. He made the Decca management understand that the band was unhappy, that Easton was gone, that the Stones could stop making music altogether if their wishes weren't met. Moreover, they had signed their contract in 1963. They were yet to receive their first royalty statement. Klein said to the bewildered Decca suits, he was expecting a complete statement in 24 hours. Then he led his clients away from the meeting room. The next day, Klein got the statement. Plus an offer for an improved war deal. Klein laughed it off. There was no guaranteed earning, nor any advance. It was a substandard contract even for an entry act in early 1965. And these were the Rolling Stones, and he was Alan Klein. Decca soon learned how inflexible and brusque Klein could be. At the end of the process, the Stones walked away with a $600,000 advance for a one-year contract covering the States, and one for the rest of the world for another $600,000. Klein worked out the renewal of both contracts the following year, this time for $700,000 each. Suddenly, the Stones went from getting pennies when Decca felt like to be guaranteed $2,600,000 in two years. Rumor has it that Paul McCartney called Brian Epstein to know why the Stones had a better record deal they had. Klein also made sure the Stones had a better publishing deal and better performance opportunities in the States. Perhaps it was just a happy coincidence that their 1965 American tour kicked off as Satisfaction hit the number one spot on the US charts, the Stones' first stateside number one. But everything else was set to capitalize on that coincidence. Finally, Klein set up a company responsible to hold all the revenues and advances of the band's international deals, like he had done for Cook and other British invasion acts he was managing. The company was to pay the Stones their money over a 20-year period. This made sure the British tax on the earnings would be minimal. And yet. Despite millions of dollars raining from the sky like water in a tropical thunderstorm, despite the help Klein gave them with the drug charges that nearly broke the band up in 1967, despite being confirmed as business manager when the band got rid of Oldham, by 1970 the Rolling Stones had severed all ties with Alan Klein, painting him as a thief and a profiteer. What happened? Smash that like button down there and let's find out! In the beginning, as we said, Klein was Andrew Oldham's business manager. The Stones loved that. Klein was the gift that kept on giving and he was paid out of Oldham's share. Things started to change in 1967. For a start, the Stones decided to get rid of Oldham. Andrew had become an embarrassment, clueless in the studio, ineffective as a strategist, too drugged up to be effective. When the Rolling Stones tell you you are doing too much drugs, you're in too deep. So, like one would do, they decided to waste as much time as possible in the studio while recording their Satanic Majesty's request. You know, to bankrupt Oldham 
who was paying for the sessions. Once they got rid of him, though, the Stones found out they had to pay Klein as much as they had paid Oldham. Between one predatory clause and the next, this amounted to a share of 50% of all the money they earned until 1970. What happened was that Andrew had sold his existing rights to Klein. Jagger wasn't pleased. If Klein thought buying those rights was a great business idea, wasn't he obliged to tell them as their business manager? But Klein wasn't their business manager, and this was only the beginning. Through the years, Klein had started thinking. There was a lot of money sitting in the accounts of the empty companies Klein had set up for his customers. How about putting it to good use? Klein started investing that money and kept the profit for himself. Wait, that wasn't exactly ethical, right? Taking your client's money for your use is the definition of embezzlement. But Klein was clean. Technically, as a partner or owner of those companies, he had committed no crime. In early 1967, with the millions he earned this way, Alan bought Cameo Parkway, an old label slash publisher with an interesting catalogue of old rock and roll hits. But Klein had bought it to do a reverse takeover of his new company, ABKCO. A reverse takeover is a quick and legal way to get your business onto the stock market without fulfilling all the regulations. Klein wanted ABKCO to produce films, but it was obviously a good vehicle to manufacture his clients' records too. As it happened, ABKCO experienced a huge increase in price over the market. The stock went from $1.75 per share in 1967 to over $76 in February 1968, an increase of more than 43 times the initial capital in little over six months. Klein was rolling in it. But why did this upset the Rolling Stones? Because ABKCO bought their entire back catalogue and the rights to issue their new albums until 1970. So, in just one year, Klein had gone from being a free help to becoming a demanding business partner and their record label. You can appreciate how this could piss the stones off. In the first episode, I joked that Alan Klein was a real-life Anakin Skywalker. This episode shows further evidence of that wild claim. On one level, Klein was intelligent and dependable. He was the guy who made labels pay. Every single one of his clients received a lot more money and rights through their association with Klein. And if we only look at this side of Klein's character, he was certainly a hero. But there was also a much darker side to the man. In his unquenchable thirst for getting more money, more successes, more love, Allen did many questionable things. Embezzlement, conflicts of interest. We've seen it all. What can we make of it? Who was Alan Klein? If you want, you can give me a piece of your mind with a comment. Personally, I will reserve my judgment until the very end of this trilogy, until the very end of the episode, in which we'll see how Klein got to manage the holy grail of the 1960s music scene, the Beatles. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Bass, music you love!